book two, which we looked at very perfunctorily yesterday, you notice that after Canto two, there are a number of cantos dealing with the worlds of life, <clears throat> the worlds belonging to the realm consciousness of the vital. <clears throat> After that you have cantos 7 and 8 which talk about Ashwapati's descent into night and 8 world of falsehood, the mother of evil and the sons of darkness from which I read out a couple of passages yesterday. After that you have cantos 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, sorry, yeah, all these are cantos dealing with the worlds of the mind, the mental level worlds. Of these, you and I are now familiar with the world described in Canto 10, kingdoms and godheads of the little mind. But the words described in 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 have been accessible to great saints, yogis and so on. They are not ordinarily accessible to you and me. And Ashwapati now undertakes an exploration of these words as well. So until the end of Canto 15, he is still in the mental world. Some of them, as I said, are accessible to us. Some of them are not accessible to us ordinarily. Now, at the end of Canto 15, he finds himself in a region where all mentalization comes to an end. And on page... <coughs> Three hundred and one, the last five, six lines, you have this description. He communed with the incommunicable beings of a wider consciousness were his friends. Forms of a larger, subtler make drew near. The gods conversed with him behind life's veil. Neighbor, his being grew to nature's crests. The primal energy took him in its arms. His brain was wrapped in overwhelming light. An all-embracing knowledge seized his heart. Thoughts rose in him. No earthly mind can hold. Might's played that never coursed through mortal nerves. He scanned the secrets of the overmind. He bore the rapture of the oversoul. Now this is the region of the overmind, which is probably the highest range in the mental region. And Ashwapati finds himself now at that point. Now when he reaches that point, he suddenly realizes that although he now has a fairly good idea of the various ranges of consciousness man has already arisen from, the physical, the vital, and some levels of mind which are still strangers to man in general. As I said, these are ranges to which saints and yogis generally have access. He is now familiar with all these, and yet he does not find there what he has been looking for. He has been looking for a secret. He has been looking for a power. He has been looking for a truth that will be able to transform human life, that will be able to cut the knot of ignorance, death, insufficiency, which has incapacitated man's life, which has made human life accursed in spite of all the blessings that have come down to us. And so, on, on the very first line, uh, the next book, next canto, page 305, he says, All is too little that the world can give. Its power and knowledge 
are the gifts of time and cannot fill the spirit's sacred thirst. The sacred thirst of the spirit cannot be quenched by anything that he has so far come across. A few lines later, when you reach that point, you are overcome by a feeling that all this effort has been vain. Mind builds up logic, builds up theories. It has a tremendous advantage of having to use reason. And reason is our God. And very often, as you see, Ashwapati analyzes what are the strengths of reason, what are the weaknesses of reason and so on. So he is overcome by a feel, feeling of futility. In spite of this, we have not yet been able to get to this creative principle. So he says, a few lines later down the same page, the labor to know seemed a vain strife of mind. All knowledge ended in the unknowable. The effort to rule seemed a vain pride of will, a trivial achievement scorned by time. All power retired into the omnipotent. A cave of darkness guards the eternal light. A silence settled on his striving heart. Absolved from the voices of the world's desire, he turned to the ineffable's timeless call. Now at this point, he suddenly becomes aware of something which is in the ineffable's region, which is the transcendental region. And he must go there because nothing which he has so far found has been of any consequence. And so, he transcends this limit and tries to go beyond it. Now when you do this, traditionally this is called the experience of Nirvana. That is, all mental structures, all mental formations are completely dissolved. And you do not, you have a feeling that nothing exists here except a bare emptiness in which you have merged yourself. The world that you are talking about, the ideals that you have been talking about, nothing really exists. And this experience of nirvana, which you, in which you feel that your entire being has merged itself into it, where the drop has merged itself with the ocean, and so there is no existence of the drop, all that remains is this ocean of peace, ocean of joy, this is a tremendous experience which is called the experience of Kaivalya. All, all, what exists? Just that exists. And where are you? There is no answer to this question. I have never existed. I don't exist. I will never exist. The entire individuality has reached a point of absolute extinction. Now by and large, this has been regarded as the highest experience, this is the moksha, this is the nirvana, this is the kaivalya and various spiritual disciplines prescribed various ways of getting here. And this is what it descends on Ashwapati at this point and this is described on page 308, <coughs> middle of page 308, a vastness brooded free from sense of space an everlastingness cut off from time, a strange, sublime, inalterable peace, silent, rejected from it, world and soul. The silence that he felt descending on him rejected the world. He felt the world never existed. Where is the world? This is the mithya. You see, this is, this is the realization. If there is Brahman, there is no world. If there is world, there is no Brahman. So you have to make a choice. So if you have this world, the absolute reality doesn't exist. But if you face that absolute reality, then there is no world. So there is no world, there is no soul, there is no individual being. A star companionless reality, it's a companionless reality. That's why it's called Kaivalya. You are all alone, it's companionless answered at last to his soul's passionate search, passionless, wordless, absorbed in its fathomless hush, 
keeping the mystery none would ever pierce it brooded inscrutable and intangible facing him with its dumb tremendous calm it had no kinship with the universe you feel that you never belong to this creation you never were you are nothing to do with this creation you are no part of this creation and where is the creation the creation is a distant shadowy figure floating somewhere it has no reality at all there was no act no movement in its vast life's question met by its silence died on her lips the world's effort ceased convicted of ignorance finding no sanction of supernal light there was no mind there with its need to know there was no heart there with its need to love so in that world there is no god there is no bhakta it's only one experience of oneness with this emptiness all person perished in its namelessness there was no second it had no partner or peer only itself was real to itself it's called therefore that it's neither he nor she it is just that a pure existence safe from thought and mood a consciousness of unshared immortal bliss it dwelt aloof in its bare infinite one and unique unutterably soul a being formless featureless and mute it is nirakara it's formless featureless mute silent that knew itself by its own timeless self aware forever in its motionless depths uncreating uncreated and unborn uncreating you ask these people who created the world the answer is where is the world i don't see the world there is no question of the world being created as soon as you have this experience the world simply disappears the one by whom all live who lives by none an immeasurable luminous secrecy guarded by the veils of the unmanifest above the changing cosmic interlude abode supreme immutably the same a silent cause occult impenetrable infinite eternal unthinkable alone the next canto also begins with the same experience <clears throat> Sri Aurobindo has a beautiful sonnet also on Nirvana. I wanted to bring it, but last minute I forgot to bring his complete poems. Uh, you will find there a sonnet, the title Nirvana. It's a beautiful sonnet. Uh, <clears throat> Some day when you have time, you should look into it. The same experience is being described uh, on page three hundred and ten, the very beginning of page three hundred and ten. A stillness. absolute incommunicable meets the sheer self discovery of the soul a wall of stillness shuts it from the world a gulf of stillness swallows up the sense and makes unreal all that the mind has known all that the laboring senses still would weave prolonging an imaged unreality self's vast spiritual silence occupies space only the inconceivable is left only the nameless without space and time abolished is the burdening need of life thought falls from us we cease from joy and grief the ego is dead we are freed from being and care we have done with birth and death and work and fate see this is this is the ultimate no punarapi jananam punarapi maranam there is no birth no death we have done with birth and death everything has been annihilated even the individual is annihilated we have become one with this absolute silence absolute joy now this is the this is the experience which is so overwhelming in its intensity 
as I said, all of us very often in life feel like little drops of water which the wind can blow off, the sun can dry in no time. But when this drop merges with the ocean, the ocean's strength, the ocean's immortality is a part of the immortality and strength of this drop of water. That's the kind of feeling. It's overwhelming in every way. For some people it comes predominantly as peace, for some people it comes predominantly as bliss, but this is an experience and so overwhelming that most people are convinced there is nothing beyond this. This is it. This is the ultimate. There is nothing beyond this. Now this is the experience of Nirvana. As I said, Sri also has written a little sonnet about it. But <clears throat> Sri Aurobindo has always maintained that Nirvanic experience is an essential stage but only a stage on an onward journey. That is a journey after Nirvana. Now many people, uh, there have been a lot of discussion about this, debates about this. Can there be anything beyond Nirvana? If you think there is anything beyond Nirvana, probably what you felt is not Nirvana. It's impossible for anybody to say there can be anything beyond Nirvana. Because since you and I haven't been there, there is no point in our discussing this in any great detail. But Sri Aurobindo has written about this and he says, I was no stranger to Nirvana. He says, Nirvana came to me without so much as knocking on my, at my door. Didn't even ask me, may I come in? It simply possessed me. Nirvanic experience simply possessed me. And I was under its spell for months and months. You know, there was a time when, when he was in such absolute yogic trance, uh, partly in Alipur jail and partly before that, Sri Aurobindo had to be fed. He didn't even remember that he had to eat. People who used, attended on him used to feed him on time. He was possessed, absolutely possessed by that experience. And uh, he had this experience. He said, it's not as if... It's not as if I don't know the Nirvanic experience. There is Nirvanic experience. But he always maintained that the Nirvanic experience is not the ultimate. Uh, there is a lot that can be said about this point. Many things which are controversial. Uh, people don't like, uh, many people don't like this because it somehow gives the impression that we are going against the tradition. Uh, this Nirvanic experience is the highest experience posited by most uh, spiritual disciplines and it is basically an experience of negativity, an experience of escaping from the world and it doesn't seem to have any kind of issue. Now, in India, there are many theories there are the Shankarite Advaita, there are, there are various kinds of Dvaitas, there are Ramanujacharyas, Vishishta Advaita, there is Madhvas, Dvaita and so on. And so Shankara's Advaita is not the only or the most predominant Indian school of thought. But somehow, after the Westerners started taking an interest in Indian philosophy, somehow they have tended to regard Shankara Advaita as the primary, you know, main, predominant school of Indian thought. Now, and therefore they have always, when, I, when they look, about, look at India, the Indian metaphysics, they always have looked at Shankara metaphysics. But Shankara to me is a, a great mysterious figure. Uh, Shankara, for example, the man, the, the great saint, the great Acharya who wrote commentaries, on the Gita, on the Upanishad, on the Brahma Sutra, is also the person who wrote Saundarya Lahari, is also the person who wrote absolutely rapturous lyrics in adoration of the Divine Mother. Now it's very difficult for you to combine these, you know, it's combine this Advaitin with this great devotee of the Divine Mother. 
So I have a feeling that there is a Shankara whom we don't understand. There is a Shankara who provided a metaphysics and this metaphysics had generally been regarded by Westerners as very rigorous. Sri Aurobindo himself has pointed out that probably the world has hardly ever seen a more brilliant mind than Shankara's. That's what he says in the Life Divine. But he does not accept, Sri Aurobindo doesn't accept Nirvana as the ultimate stage in the spiritual journey. He, however, does emphasize that Nirvana is an essential stage until you annihilate all the constructions of the human mind, you cannot go beyond the human mind. You have to go beyond the human mind. To be able to do that, you have to destroy all constructions that the mind has made. We don't realize to what extent our worldview, our understanding of reality, our understanding of life is all conditioned by our mind. But there is a reality beyond the mind. And if you want to get to that reality, a more comprehensive reality, you have to let go all that the mind has given you. And this process, therefore, of annihilating mental constructions, making you as be becoming a zero, is absolutely essential. But that is not the destination, that's only a stage in our journey. Now, if you regard Nirvana as a destination, Westerners have very often said uh, Indian viewpoint, Indian metaphysics is generally life negating. It is not life affirming. After all, you say, oh, the world has no reality. The world has reality until you have found the Brahman. When you have found the Brahman, the world immediately loses its reality. So ultimately our destination is Brahman. So since Brahman is our destination, this world is a kind of pragmatic reality. You have to put up with it somehow or the other. But you know, someday you are going to reject it and go beyond, so why make a big fuss about it? This, is, this has been the attitude of Indians. So Indians generally are life-negating. Indians, therefore, do not take the life seriously. All these things have been said by Western critics about Indian metaphysics. But Sri points out that this is one particular school of thought. There are other schools of thought which do not regard uh, this as the highest experience. They do not regard life negation as primary to the Indian uh, viewpoint. Uh, I don't want to say more about this, uh, but I would like to say one thing, that in the history of Indian philosophical thought, uh, Hindu ideology, Hindu metaphysics, has had to face several challenges. And depending on what challenge it meets, the person who is propounding the Hindu, Hindu ideology tends to give it a different shape. Take, for example, if you read Mahatma Gandhi, or to some extent if you read Vivekanand, Swami Vivekanand, they both make Hinduism sound Christian. Now, you can't help it. Because they were at that time facing the challenge from Christianity. There was a school of thought at that time, as you know in India, that Indian spirituality had no meaning, it was absolutely worthless and so on. So these people were trying to establish the credentials of Hindu religion in the face of this criticism and in trying to answer those critics, they had to say, oh, is there, are these the highest values? We also have this. Is that the highest value? We also have this. This tends to be the case exactly the same way when Shankara was trying to re-establish Hinduism, he was meeting the challenge of Buddhism. And therefore, when Shankara interprets Hinduism, he makes it look almost like Buddhism. And by doing this, he was able to establish the Hindu view of life or Hindu metaphysics, Hindu religion, as you know. By about the 2nd or 3rd century AD, Hinduism had almost disappeared from the face of India. Uh, there was Buddhism, there was Jainism. All over the south you had Jainism, all over the north you had Buddhism. Hinduism was, had hardly disappeared, was on the verge of extinction. Shankara was the man who brought it back and he brought it back by doing exactly this. He took up the Hindu metaphysics and answer the challenges of the time. 
So it is therefore, in my view, it is erroneous to pin down Shankara to what he said at that time and, and say, this is all that Shankara is. For me, Shankara is far greater than his metaphysics. Shankara is far greater than his commentaries on Brahma Sutra, his commentary on the Gita and the commentary on, on, on uh, Upanishads. Uh, however, uh, although Sri Aurobindo respects what Shankara has said and although Sri Aurobindo regards Nirvana as an essential condition, you can't get far in the spiritual life without having this experience of Nirvana, he says there is a stage beyond Nirvana where you affirm the world, you go back to this world and realize that God is this world itself. This world itself is throbbing with God. That experience which is a positive experience, Nirvana is a negative experience. Nirvana says nothing, none of this is God. After going back, then you realize everything here that you have left behind is pulsating with God, vibrating with God. This entire world is God. That's the experience. Ashwapati now is on the verge of breaking through this experience. As I said, he has this experience where the ego is dead. We are freed from being and care. We have done with birth and death and work and fate. And then suddenly you have this. O oh soul, it is too early to rejoice. See, Ashwapati is suddenly kind of pulled back. O oh soul, it is too early to rejoice. Don't declare a holiday yet. This is not it. Why? Thou hast reached the boundless silence of the self. Thou hast leaped into a glad divine abyss. But where hast thou thrown self's mission and self's power? You see, the human being has come here. Why has he come here? He has come here to go back. Then why did he have to come here? You see, we are all in a hurry to get back to that place when, where we came. Well, back to God. Well, you know, it, it sometimes, very often I visualize something of this kind. You are about to set out from your house early in the morning. You have taken your cycle, you have taken a couple of bags and you are about to go out. I come to see you and I am asking you, where are you going? Or why are you going out? Easy question, why are you going out? Suppose I gave the answer, I am going out to come back home. What kind of an answer is it? Surely everybody who goes out will eventually come back home, but why are you going out now? To meet with friends, to buy vegetables, to go to a pharmacy, get some medicines. I have some purpose in going out. So God took a plunge into ignorance and we all came out of that. What is the purpose of this outing? Going back, is it? As early as possible, as fast as possible, let's go back. So Ashwapati is all being asked this question. You are negating everything. The world is not true. There is no reality in the world. But why did we come, come here? What was the purpose of our coming here? Why did God create this world and create this world in this particularly funny way when everybody is miserable most of the time? Why did God create such a world? What was the need for such a world? If God wanted to give us all a holiday here, he would have created a Hawaii or whatever, everything is fine, you don't have to pay taxes, there is no garbage, nobody gets old, nobody dies, so you have a small holiday and then go back. Why did he create this terrible, terrible world where there is so much pain, so much suffering and after we've done all these things we are told, oh look, don't take this suffering too seriously, don't take this world too seriously, this is all a mythya, we have to all go back there. What kind of a world is it? How, who created this? 
This is the question. And he says, But where hast thou thrown self's mission and self's power? On what dead bank on the eternal's road? One was within thee, who was self and world. What hast thou done for his purpose in the stars? Escape brings not the victory and the crown. We all seem to be eager to escape. Life is a prison. Life is a trap. Let's all escape from it. Now this kind of an attitude can make a civilization entirely inward looking, entirely world shunning, and then it doesn't matter who comes and occupies your country. The British came, occupied Delhi. Oh, that's a mitya that will go away someday. British Empire, you don't have to take it seriously. Who rules the country? What does it matter? It's all a mitya. This chap came, attacked the Somnath temple for 17 times or 13 times, 14 times, I don't know. Uh, what does it matter? It's all a mitya. Where is the Somnath temple? What is it? It's all a mitya. The attacker is a mitya. The temple is a mitya. We are all mithyas. Shivoham, Shivoham. We all sat with our eyes closed looking inside. Where for a whole thousands of a thousand years, any, anybody who just wanted to come in, came into the country, occupied the country, bossed over us for a thousand years and we said, we are all safe. God inside, God above. All this is a maya, mitya, a fleeting thing, a passing thing. Nobody need take this very seriously. So to some extent, this kind of thing has hurt the Indian psyche, the Indian mind. Sri Aurobindo points out, the Vedic ideology was to realize the world is imperfect, and the Vedic prayers were for the gods to descend in us so that with these powers we can exert ourselves and make this world perfect. Somehow, as I have always maintained, the Indian spirituality has two major branches. One branch takes you towards the monk, the other takes you towards the rishi. The monk tradition became strong after Buddha and the rishi tradition gradually got forgotten. The rishi is one who lives in the world, who exerts for the world and who wants to bring perfection to the world, who wants to make this world a heaven. That's the Rushi ideal, and that was the Vedic ideal. Then came Buddhism, along with it came this, a phase of about 1,000, 2,000 years, when somehow we didn't realize that the world was important. This is the world, this is the God, we are called here, we have been invited here to participate in this great sacrifice, the Holocaust of the Supreme. The Supreme has taken this plunge. We are going back. This world has to be made perfect. This was forgotten. And Sri has brought back this Vedic ideal once again. And this assertion that the world is important, bringing God to this world is the primary purpose of existence and not running away from life. This has been the revival, this has been the Vedic revival Sri has been talking about. He has not been talking about Vedic revival in the sense we should all give up English, we should all go back to the Vedas and study Vedas and nothing else. That's not what he's talking about. It is the Vedic spirit. It's the Vedic love of life. This life, this is a life which has to have a spiritual foundation but a material structure. You can't have a spiritual foundation and a spiritual structure. This is the mistake we are trying to make. We have to have a spiritual foundation but the material structure. This world is a material world. And nothing succeeds here which has not paid its dues to matter. In the West, what they are trying to do? They are trying to build a material structure on a material foundation. That will not stand. You need to build a material structure but on a spiritual foundation. This was the Vedic ideal and we must go back to it. That's what Sri has always insisted and that was his quest and that is now, as you can see, reflected in Ashwapati's ideology. And so, 
one was within thee who was self and world what hast thou done for his purpose in the stars escape brings not the victory and the crown something thou came to do from the unknown but nothing is finished and the world goes on because only half god's cosmic work is done only the everlasting no has neared and stared into thy eyes and kill thy heart but where is the lovers everlasting yes and immortality in the secret heart the voice that chants to the creator fire the symboled om the great ascending world the bridge between the rapture and the calm the passion and the beauty of the bride the chamber where the glorious enemies kiss the smile that saves the golden peak of things this true is truth at the mystic fount of life a black veil has been lifted we have seen the mighty shadow of the omniscient lord but who has lifted up the veil of light and who has seen the body of the king there are two veils on the face of truth one is the veil of avidya the other is the veil of vidya both have to be lifted so as uh, the ishopanishad says the face of truth is also covered by suvar a golden lid that golden lid has also to be removed just because it's a golden lid it doesn't become our ideal golden lid it is still a lid that has to be separated that has to be taken away and therefore the poet is asking the black veil has been lifted the veil of avidya of ignorance has been lifted and we have seen the mighty shadow of the omniscient lord and what you see when the first veil is lifted the shadow of the lord you don't see the lord this nirvana this negation is a shadow of the lord what do you have to do then but who has lifted up the veil of light the veil of light has to be lifted and then what happens and who has seen the body of the king then you see the body of the king the shopnishad very clearly says you have to go beyond vidya and avidya and you have to cultivate both vidya and avidya we need the knowledge of the one and also the knowledge of the many we can't do just with the knowledge of the many not just the knowledge of the one in india we ignore the knowledge of the many and therefore this is what has happened to this country in the west there was a tendency to ignore the knowledge of the one behind the many what we need is one and many both have to be simultaneously cultivated and therefore towards the end of that page it says a high and blank negation is not all a huge extinction is not god's last word extinction from this world negation of this world getting out of this world nirvana from this world that is not all a huge extinction is not god's last word life's ultimate sense the close of being's course the meaning of this great mysterious world in absolute silence sleeps an absolute power awaking it can wake the trance bound soul and in the ray reveal the parent sun it can make the world a vessel of spirit's force it can fashion in the clay god's perfect shape and finally in two lines very beautifully says to free the self is but one radiant pace to free our inner being from ignorance is only one step what do we have to do we have also to free our body our mind our life energies from the hold of ignorance here to fulfill himself was god's desire god created this world with this idea of fulfilling himself and we are bent upon frustrating god's plan instead of 
helping instead of trying to fulfill God here on earth, we are shortchanging him as it were by winding up our business and saying, let us all head back to that place. And that, she says, to free the self is but one radiant pace. Here to fulfill himself was God's desire. Well, when Ashwapati is determined that he will not rest in this realm of Nirvana, he has to go beyond it. Then what happens? About five lines, six lines from the top of that page, 312, he immediately begins to feel the presence of the Divine Mother. The Divine Mother is the transcendental Shakti. She is beyond this world. Across the silence of the ultimate calm, out of a marvelous transcendent score, a body of wonder and translucency, as if a sweet mystic summary of herself, escaping into the original bliss, had come enlarged out of eternity, someone came infinite and absolute, a being of wisdom, power and delight, even as a mother draws her child to her arms, took to her breast nature and world and soul, abolishing the signless emptiness, breaking the vacancy and the voiceless hush, piercing the limitless unknowable into the liberty of the motionless depths a beautiful and felicitous luster stole. This is a fairly long description. Uh, on page 314, you have the culmination of the description, about six, seven lines from the top. And these are the lines which we read out on the very first day as an invocation. It's a very well-known rhymes. I will read that invocation and conclude. At the head she stands of birth and toil and fate. In their slow round the cycles turn to her call. Alone her hands can change time's dragon base. Hers is the mystery the night conceals. The spirit's alchemist energy is hers. She is the golden bridge, the wonderful fire, the luminous heart of the unknown is she, a power of silence in the depths of God. She is the force, the inevitable world, the magnet of our difficult ascent, the sun from which we kindle all of our suns, the light that leans from the unrealized vasts, the joy that beckons from the impossible, the might of all that never yet came down. All nature dumbly calls to her alone to heal with her feet the aching throb of life and break the seals on the dim soul of man and kindle her fire in the closed heart of things. All here shall be one day her sweetness is home. All contraries prepare her harmony. Towards her our knowledge climbs, our passion gropes, in her miraculous rapture we shall dwell. Her clasp shall turn to ecstasy our pain. Our self shall be one self with all through her. <laughs>